I recently have been looking at uh, what the connection between the health of the vaginal area, including the, the cervix and how it plays out in the other parts of our body. So for example, in utero, I don't know if you knew this, I, I just recently learned this, that our vocal cords and our cervix originally were of the same tissue and then they separate out and they become your vocal cords, they become your, your cervix. And if you look at the tissue themselves, like if you actually go and look at them, uh, at Google them, you'll see they look very, very similar. So could you use yogurts like this? I don't know if you're doing it like as a douche or if you have to just, you just eat it, but could we start to look at the vaginal area, the microbiome as the vaginal area to start to affect all other areas in a woman's body? Do we know anything about that? Yeah, that's a, a, an emerging concept, this idea of crosstalk between species and also mm. translocation. So I, I find it remarkable. A woman can take, let's just say lactobacillus crispatus. It's t by the way, when you, when you and I talk about these things, your listeners have to know that sometimes we're talking about the science that has not yet been commercialized. So it's really tough to find mm, lactobacillus well crispatus, but you can. Like Jaro has a, a, a product called Jarodophilus Women. Net does have the crispatus in mm -hmm. it. So there's going to be mm -hmm. more and more products to do this because there's some hurdles to go through, regulatory and commercial, going from the laboratory to a commercial product. And so there's there's a delay of typically a couple of years between science and then commercialization. I, I find it remarkable. A woman can take, let's say, lactobacillus crispatus orally, and it will populate her vagina and her bladder. Well, how did it get there? There's mm -hmm. no connection that anybody knows of. Well, it's, it's presumptively by contiguity because they're near each other in the perineum. You know, they're real close. So mm -hmm. they somehow share. Yeah. So that's also true. It's kind of it's kind of creepy. It's also true of the fecal microbes. So that whole area is, mm -hmm. is a big party area. It's got all kinds of stuff being shared. So, but there's also uh, another, a reverse example would be Fusobacterium nucleatum. This is a microbe that we all have in our mouths. By the way, the mouth is the second most densely populated microbiome after the colon. So, so think yeah. about that when you kiss your honey. Yep. Uh, well, one microbe that yep. proliferates is called Fusobacterium nucleatum, and if you have gingivitis or even worse, periodontitis, the populations of fusobacterium go way up. And then it implants itself in your okay. colon where it's associated with colon cancer. Wow. If I take that microbe, put it in a mouse with a normal colon, it gets colon cancer. If you look at colon cancer from a human that's been taken out, it's filled with fusobacterium. Now, here's the kicker. How did it get from here to colon? Well, swallowing, right? Mm. No, it gets right. there by the bloodstream. Yeah. So cross talk. It's becoming clear now. Yeah. Uh, how about another one? If a woman takes Bifidobacteria infantis, like the Avivo strain, EVC001 strain, that has the best science from UC Davis. Mm -hmm. If a woman takes that okay. microbe, there's some uh, some very elegant work from Ruth Alonso's lab in Spain, where she, they did something crazy. They took brains of people who died, young people who died in traumatic accidents, like car accidents, and then stained the brain for fungi. No fungi. They took the brains of people hmm. who were old but didn't die of dementia, moderate fungal infestation. They took the brains of people who died of Alzheimer's, filled like a Wyoming sky at night, filled with fungi, fungus. They took it further. They looked for fungal proteins and DNA in the bloodstream and the cerebrospinal fluid in people filled with fungal proteins and DNA. And then the real kicker, a Harvard group about two years ago showed that, you know, the stuff that accumulates in people with dementia is beta amyloid plaque. And there are drugs. Mm -hmm effectively reduce beta amyloid plaque. There's several of them and they all make your dementia worse. <laughs> so, mm. so the, wow. the, the theory has, is, is undergoing change. Maybe beta amyloid plaque is not the cause. Maybe it's a consequence. So this Harvard group looked mm. at the microbial effects of beta amyloid plaque. It's not a very good antibacterial. It's an excellent potent antifungal. Isn't that interesting? Well, what the hell? It's crazy. Does that mean there's an important subset of people with dementia that's due to fungal infestation? And if so, where did it come from? Well, some people like Dale Bredesen say the sinuses. I say it's the colon. I, I say it's the GI tract. Because as you know, mm. as, as common as SIBO is, CFO, small intestinal fungal, or at least colonic overgrowth of fungi, is also very, very common.